This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone to PJC Today. Here we showcase some of the exciting events and programs happening at Pensacola Junior College. We're thrilled in this May edition of PJC Today to welcome well-known Southern author Rita Grimsley Johnson. Many of you might remember Rita's syndicated column which ran in the Pensacola News Journal for several years. Welcome Rita, thank you for choosing PJC for the first stop on your Florida tour of your new book which is? Enchanted Evening Barbie and the Second Coming. <laughs> now that's an interesting title. It rolls Tell. right off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, it does. So how did you get there to that title? Well, any religious faith I had was eclipsed once a year when I was a child by the passion that I'd always have for one toy. And I would literally pray that Jesus not come back to earth until I would get my enchanted evening Barbie dress for my Barbie doll or <laughs> my visible horse or whatever I wanted that, oh, that particular year. So. so that particular year and, and you would choose a favorite toy and in, in chapter two of your book and this is just a, a really interesting wonderful cover and, and I know there's a story there too but you talk about a special teddy bear Tell us that story. It's an excerpt from chapter two, I believe. Well, in an embarrassing lapse of imagination, I named my teddy bear Ted, but it was the first Christmas gift I remember getting from Santa Claus. And I was living in Pensacola, and I called Ted the most under understanding male I ever slept with. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have Ted. He, he lives in Mississippi now, but he's pretty raggedy, but he's still a wonderful friend. And he accompanied you everywhere. He did. My father worked as the meat market manager at the Quick Check in Pensacola. And uh -huh. once we went to check on things after hours, and I had Ted with me, and I left him in the produce department. <laughs> and I realized it when it was bedtime, and my father had to go back down to the store and retrieve Ted, who smelled like lettuce for several days afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and you wore Ted as a, I think you described it, a boa. <laughs> when you took him places, uh, that that was an interesting description. I would sling him over my shoulder. I wasn't a very good friend always. I was always leaving him places and dragging him through sand and making him stick out his red felt tongue at other cars when we were traveling in the car together. So uh, he was he was abused a bit, but mm -hmm. he he but remained well loyal and a well loved. loved. Toy. Yes. Now you <laughs> also use colors, descriptions, and. Um, color plays a big part of your memories that when you talk about your memoirs. Share some of those special colors. Well, especially in Pensacola. Out. I lived here from ages one to six, so I, don't, I have few memories, but they are very vivid and very good memories and very colorful. We had a pink cinder block house, and I assume because we lived in a pink house, we must be rich. Oh. And it was on the bay, and so that color I remember well. We even had a pink patio that my father made. The grout was pink. I don't know how he managed that, but he did. And of course I remember the, the bottle green ocean and the white sand. And it just seemed like all my memories from here are very colorful and precious. There was a drive-in place that we liked to go eat called the, the Shrimp Box. Yes. And I still remember it well. And my very first surprise birthday party was in Pensacola when I was six. And then you went on to live in Montgomery, Alabama from here? I did. I grew up, um, the rest of my childhood was spent in Montgomery, which, to, to be honest, my sister and I cried the day we moved from Pensacola to Montgomery. We thought it was a huge demotion to leave oh, the beach really? and the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we didn't know if we would like Montgomery or not. Of course, we learned to love Montgomery. We were mm -hmm. <clears throat> young and uh, 
could be molded, but uh, we were upset about leaving Pensacola. I remember that well. You talk about in your book that Pensacola was the cool place <laughs> for all of your cousins from Georgia to visit because we had the sand and the beautiful white beaches. So what do you think of uh, the changes in Pensacola these days? Well, I, it's amazing how it's grown, but the, the core town and the the atmosphere I remember is still here, and I'm relieved about that. Mm -hmm. I think the National Seashore helps that. You mm -hmm. still have pristine beach that's not totally developed, and you don't find that many places. So, yes. so with great relief, I can say I still see the Pensacola of my childhood here. Yes, we can thank um, J. Earl Bowden of the Pensacola News Journal for working towards getting the National Seashore many, many, I many see. years ago. Okay. Of course, we. Um, the News Journal was a place that you you worked and wrote, and they ran your column for many years. Well, I didn't work for oh, the News okay. Journal, but the column did run there, uh -huh. uh, and I got lots of letters, both positive and negative, <laughs> from Pensacola. <laughs> I don't think my politics were real mainstream for this uh -huh. area, but I got a lot of nice, nice correspondence from here, too. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we would love to see your column start back up. So would any I. Day. <laughs> any day. Um, share with us what sparked your interest in writing a uh, very special professor? Well, actually, um, in even in grammar school, I always excelled in English compositions. Teachers would always praise my English skills and not so much my math and science. <laughs> I had a real deficit going there, but you know, I worked for praise and I, I wanted to do what I was good at. So in the eighth grade was the first time we were allowed to choose a free period, they called it an elective, and the choices were home economics or creative writing. So uh -huh. I went with creative writing and what we did in that class period was put out the school newspaper. And I loved it. Got my first byline on a three paragraph story about a girls volleyball game. And I spent the rest of the week looking at this byline and thinking, what a rush. Yeah. So after that point, I never wanted to do anything but work for a newspaper. Mm. That's what I've done. Yes, and you've won many awards. Congratulations. It's an impressive career that you've had. And um, I wonder if you could share a story about uh, Professor Tom Botsford and the role he played. He's our English and journalism professor here at the college. Tom Botsford was the editor of the Auburn University student paper, The Plainsman, when I began trying to write for it in earnest. And he was, I think he was already maybe a graduate student and I was a sophomore. He was worldly, he knew about jazz, <laughs> he just was, he smoked a pipe, he was beyond cool. But he was also my very first editor and a really good newspaper editor. And I turned in the first column I ever wrote to Tom. It was a saccharine piece about my older sister and he somehow helped me shape that into a usable column for the student newspaper. He was encouraging, but he was, he was good. He was a good editor. And I wouldn't be sitting here because I had no confidence whatsoever. You can have raw talent, but if you don't develop a little confidence, you're never going to do anything with it. And that's what Tom did for me. Well, that's quite a statement that you would not be sitting here if not for I believe that. He, Tom Botsford. I would have quit the Plainsman. I would have bolted out of that door if somebody had said one negative thing. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he didn't. He could... He could correct you and work with you, but and do it in such a smooth, positive way. He he was great. We're fortunate to have Tom, as as the head of our English and journalism department, and he still plays a very mean saxophone. I can tell you, <laughs> <laughs> we have him uh, play at many of our college events, and everyone always looks forward to when Professor Tom Botsford is in the room. And um, I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about your wood, your wind chime fetish and <laughs> some of the things that you experienced uh, and, and share with us uh, from your book. Well, one of the nice memories from Pensacola, I had, we had friends here, Margaret and Sam Blankenbaker, who also lived on Pensacola Bay. And we walked over to see Margaret one day. I, I went with my mother to visit Margaret. And before I even saw the wind chimes, I heard this wonderful sound. And it was the old fashioned glass kind of wind chimes that mm. are hard to find now. Mm. And Margaret had hung them so that they caught the bay breeze. And I just remember thinking that was magical. And since that day, I have loved wind chimes. I have them everywhere. 
Well, you, you know, in your book, your descriptions are very poignant. You talk about backyard sprinklers, feuding religious factions, <laughs> Christmas traditions all told with great humor. Share some more stories with us from your book. Well, the book started out to be a memoir as told through pivotal Christmases in my life. Not every single Christmas, but mm -hmm. it seemed like a lot happened to me at Christmas time. Uh -huh. For instance, my former husband, Jimmy Johnson, who draws the comic strip Arlo and Janice that runs in the paper here, we tried to start our own weekly newspaper on St. Simon's Island, and it lasted 26 weeks, but the last issue was on Christmas Day. Uh. We rolled in through 3,000 newspapers on Christmas morning and uh, then went to visit family and never never put out another issue. We were out of money and we were tired. So those kinds of stories that involve Christmas in a very peripheral way um, were what I started out to do. The book took a bit of a turn uh, before it was finished, but uh -huh. it, the Christmas theme is still there. That's wonderful. Well, we appreciate so very much you sharing all of these wonderful stories with the world. Now, the book, is it available online, in stores? And it's available both places. If it's not in your local bookstore, you can certainly ask them to order it. I hope you will. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm excited that it's out here. A little nervous. Uh -huh. it's, it's hard to talk about yourself. I've used to writing about other people, but it's, you know, it was a cathartic thing to do as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is the 50th anniversary of Barbie dolls. <laughs> Which so I did not know when really, I Really? It was just co title. coincidental. <laughs> Had uh, no clue, really. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> well, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to see Rita in action at a PJC Writer's Workshop right here. Book writing for me is convincing myself that I can be more expansive and write a little longer and, and tell a little more. In the newspaper hole, the editorial hole is shrinking with each passing day. And so you have to tell your stories quickly, succinctly, and well. You have to grab the reader by the, <clears throat> by the throat and bring them into your column quickly if you want to to deal with all the distractions that people have if you want anybody to read your column. So when I decided to do this, I uh, decided I might as well be as honest as I could with what has been a life like everyone has that's had some sadness, some good things, some bad things. I certainly haven't been perfect, but I tried to pretty much be honest with what I told. That I tried to pick the things that I thought were noteworthy, whether they were from a professional or personal part of my life. I tried to pick the more interesting things. And you've heard this old cliche about writing that if it interests you, it will interest someone else. And I think that's true. People get mad at you for the oddest things, not the things you would expect. So you can't anticipate what's gonna hurt somebody's feelings. You can, you can get yourself in a little knot if you worry about that all the time. I think that good writing, first of all, has rhythm. If you study it, if you read it over again, if you read it aloud, that you'll find it has rhythm, just like a song, just like a piece of music. The second Michael Grell told me, taught me, he said, you know, everything you've turned into me, it's pretty good, but you could just lop off the last sentence. To this day, usually you can lop off my last sentence. I make my case, I tell it, and then I go one step too far. I, I hit them over the head with a two by four. <laughs> the third R of the three R's of good writing, in my opinion, is relevance. Be sure that the details you offer are relevant. The more specific you can be, the better. I struggle. Writing never gets easy. It's, it's always a hard job, but there's nothing more rewarding than knowing that you have gotten it right, that you've gotten a good sentence or a good image that your imagery has worked. Adjectives have a place, but the ticket is strong verbs. Strong writing equals strong verbs. I tell students all the time, just learn how to write a short declarative sentence. And narrative economy is so important in any kind of writing. 
So I think that there is a musical quality to just conversation in the South that fuels storytellers. I think it, we are a region of storytellers. And as somebody said, maybe we've got more to explain. I don't know. <laughs> Pensacola Junior College is your smart first step. PJC is first in value. PJC delivers first class instruction and more than 100 first rate degree programs with affordable tuition. PJC offers flexible course schedules, night, weekend, online classes. Pensacola Junior College, your best first step to success. PJC first, be ready for what comes next. Register now, go to pjc.edu. Welcome back with us today is Rita Grimsley Johnson, former syndicated columnist and renowned Southern author. Rita is here with us on this first Florida stop promoting her new memoir, Enchanted Evening Barbie and the Second Coming. Rita, you've told us a little bit about the, your writing and your book and some of those wonderful stories. How did you get involved in and in find a love of words and wordsmithing? I loved to read. As a child, we'd go to the bookmobile and, and I'd always take as many books as they'd allow me to, to borrow. Um, and I, I guess that my writing stemmed from my love of reading. I kept a journal as a child, got a lot of praise from English teachers, and that certainly encouraged me. And it, newspapers were a way I could make a living with these words. Mm -hmm. And there's just nothing more challenging or gratifying than to craft a, a good sentence. And it doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen every time you write a column, but you know it when you do it and nothing is more exciting to me. It's just my sport. I don't know <laughs> how to describe it any other way. Now, you um, enjoy writing about the South, it seems. Why is that? Well, the South is what I know. I was born in South Georgia. I've lived in Florida, grew up in Alabama, moved to Mississippi, worked a long time for a Tennessee newspaper. My southern credentials are in order, mm -hmm. and I loved what Eudora Welty, the Mississippi short story writer, said about why she wrote about the South pretty much exclusively. She said, well, I know when things here bloom. Oh, you write yes. about what you know if you're smart. So uh -huh. um, the South is what I know. I've always lived in the Deep South, so it's easier to write about what you know. Do you think the South, with its slower pace and traditions, and the tradition of storytelling in particular, is, uh, makes for a natural magnet for writers? We are a region of storytellers. You don't ask someone here how to get to the bank and expect them to say, go three blocks and hang a left. Instead, <laughs> they tell you what happened in every building and house along the way. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> and it's a real leg up for story uh -huh. people who want to be storytellers who want to write stories for a living to have grown up in the South is just the best training there could be. Well, now, you know, growing up in Montgomery and, and spending your very young years here in Pensacola and then um, writing for Southern newspapers and, and um, all, do you think the South of your childhood is changing, is fading away? I actually was given an assignment back in 1984 by a Memphis editor to travel about the country and see if uh, the regions were losing their distinctions and if we were becoming, as was being said at that point, uh, just a homogenous kind of place. And mm -hmm. I concluded then, and I still believe, that we do maintain our regional distinctions, especially in the South. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Uh, we have the South is not perfect, we all know that, but we have this ability, I think, to, to, we have a warmth, we have a distinctive personality, just like people have distinctive personalities. And again, it's what I know, and so I've stuck with that. I've had opportunities to go to other regions. I had a very tempting offer once from Philadelphia, but I decided against it. I, it just didn't seem right somehow mm -hmm. to leave the place that, that I love uh, to for a better job or um, a different atmosphere. I, and, and I've never really had a burning desire to live anywhere else. 
Well, we're glad that you have stayed with us in the South. Now, you are currently residing in Fish Trap Hollow, <laughs> Mississippi. Tell us about Fish Trap Hollow. On the map, where Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi come together is yes. the little town of Iuka, and I live out from Iuka. I gave my hollow the name Fish Trap because there was an old fish trap on the river nearby, uh -huh. but I just wanted to keep it vague and whimsical, and I had an old neighbor who said, this ain't Fish Trap Hollow, this is Possum Hollow. So it, it did not meet with universal applause, but uh, it's just a way to, to identify the columns when I'm writing from home. Well, I was just looking here on the inside front of your book. Um, you are winner of many awards, recognized columnist, uh, the winner of the Ernie Pyle Award for Human Interest Reporting. And um, you kind of turn your eye on yourself, it says, in this book. And you also uh, were inducted into the Scripps Howard Newspapers Editorial Hall of Fame. We congratulate you. Thank you. On such an impressive career. Most of those awards, you know, just managed to collect dust and intimidate you <laughs> about your future work. But the Ernie Pyle Award was very important to me, mostly because my father is a World War II veteran mm -hmm. and loved Ernie Pyle's work. And I think when I won the Ernie Pyle, he understood what I was trying to do, perhaps for the first time with my newspaper career. So that is my sentimental favorite, plus I'm a big admirer of his work. Mm -hmm. Now you've written for newspapers, penned syndicated columns, and you've created novels and memoirs. Which to you is the most natural, your favorite type of writing and why? Well, the column is my bread and butter and has been for so long that I have to convince myself when I try to do longer work to be more expansive. I'm so used to writing in 750 word increments that if I wrote you a letter, it would be that length. Uh -huh. If I uh, write anything, it's usually I have to, I'm so much in the habit of, of writing the column. And I really think that's my strongest, the essay is my strongest suit. The essay. What advice do you have for up and coming journalists? I get asked a lot about the changing business, the newspaper business and the technology and all of that. So what I tell them now is just learn to write a short declarative sentence. <laughs> Hone your <laughs> writing skills and you'll be fine no matter what happens to the industry or the technology. You still have to have the rudimentary skills mm -hmm. and that is to be able to write a sentence that people can understand. So that never changes. So that's that's what I tell students. And then this in this age of blogging and online and tweeting and that's probably very good advice, wouldn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> and you notice an email or a text message that that is good writing. And you know, that's not just something stream of consciousness uh, with no restraint and no writing skills. I mean, so yes, it's still important. Mm -hmm. It is, isn't it? I think writing is one of those enduring arts. And, and really the, the uh, personal note, the personal aspects of getting that personal mail at home. And there's really been a resurgence lately of thank you notes and those written personal letters and, and such. Um, what do you see in the future? for you and for writers in general? I probably will write the column as long as there are any newspapers abroad that want them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't see myself abandoning the column. Sometimes I get really tired of it and think I could do without this. And then days like yesterday, I was in Pontotoc, Mississippi, and a couple of people came up to me and literally begged me to keep writing the column. So it has meant something to, to mm -hmm. people that I don't even know. So I'll keep doing that. I hope since I'm only writing one column a week now to do some more books. Mm -hmm. um, most everything I do is nonfiction. I almost feel like in the South there is no need for fiction. <laughs> <laughs> the real stories are so good. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a fiction writer, but I hope to do more books as well. Mm -hmm. Talk about uh, some of your other books. I was 
very privileged in 1989. I did the authorized biography of Charles Schultz, mm -hmm. the creator of the Peanuts comic strip. Mm -hmm. And I got to spend 11 weeks sort of shadowing him and getting to know him well. And that was an amazing experience. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, people ask what he's like. He's like all of his characters. He's philosophical like Linus and musical like Schroeder. And he was creative like Snoopy. But most of all, he was like the little lovable loser Charlie Brown. <laughs> so that was a great mm -hmm. experience and the book was fun to do. I have, um, I've written the text for a coffee table book about Georgia, which is my home state. And that was, that was fun. And then I had, my last book was uh, Poor Man's Provence, which details are tells a little about the time I spent in Cajun, Louisiana, in southwest Louisiana. Mm -hmm. My late husband and I spent part of each year for 13 years near the Chafalaya Swamp, mm. part of it on a houseboat and part in a little house. And oh. it's rich, a rich area, the food, the live music, and the, the wonderful people. So I had to write about that. Do you have a favorite author? I do, and I guess it would be Flannery O'Connor. Mm -hmm. I love her many pithy and great quotes, and the one I'm paraphrasing here, but a Northeasterner asked Flannery O'Connor why Southerners always wrote about such weirdos, and she said, because down here we still recognize them. <laughs> she, <laughs> she was full of great lines, and, and I love her short stories especially. So you have some more books in, in the future? that you're planning? Or well, I sure hope so. I, I don't like to talk about them too much until I actually mm -hmm. begin because I, I feel like you can exhaust yourself talking about things in the works and mm -hmm. then you never finish them. <laughs> At least I never finish them when I talk too much about projects. But I have a few, few ideas, a few strong ideas going. Well, we're going to look forward to those thank future you. books. And again, we want to thank you so very much for, for making Pensacola Junior College the first stop on your Florida book tour of your new book. Any parting words of, of advice or encouragement for our students in our community? Well, I'm going to quote James Thurber, who was from Columbus, Ohio, and he went back to give a speech there. And, and he thanked the audience. He said, it's nice to be remembered by a place you can't forget. And I think that seems apt here because uh -huh. I have never forgotten the, the time I spent as a very small child here. So it's nice to be asked back. And I thank Tom Bodsford in particular for making it possible. Yes, and he made it possible for you to be here today, as a matter of fact, with us on the campus uh, when he approached us and said, oh, there's something wonderful <laughs> and someone wonderful that's coming about that we want to uh, share with our community and our college. We have a mutual admiration society <laughs> going with Tom and I do. Well, he is a, a wonderful professor. Rita, thank you so very much thank again you. for for sharing your, your talents and with the world. My pleasure, thank and, you. And uh, for being here and sharing your time with us today. Best wishes on the rest of your book tour. Thanks. We look forward to it. Thank you all for tuning in to PJC's final show of the season. Be sure to join us for our next show in September when we focus on PJC's amazing math and science opportunities. Again, thank you for joining us. Good day. <laughs>